Oh, hi, Chris. Hi, this is Chris. I'm back. Uh, date is uh, May 25th, Year of Our Savior 2016. This is Bible study number 54. Yes, Bible study number 54. And the title of this is going to be The Council of Trent. The Council of Trent. And this can be very deceiving because, folks, there is, a, I know a, a, of a of a King James Bible believing pastor that quoted the Council of Trent like it was a good thing, and he was he was talking about the apocryphal writings. But this is a deception. Even if you're a King James Bible believing Christian, you can be deceived. Okay, and go out of the Bible. <clears throat> All right. So we see that. Let me just talk a little bit about the Council of Trent because maybe there are people who are not aware of it. On March uh, 15th, 1517, the Fifth uh, Council of the Lateran which is 1512 to 1517 is the 18th ecumenical council to be recognized by the Roman Catholic Church and the last one before the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> All right, so we see that they closed its activities with a number of reform proposals on the selection of bishops, taxation, censor censorship, and preaching, but not on the major problems that confronted the church in Germany and other parts of Europe, and that was the Reformation getting back to the Bible. Praise God. A few months later, on uh, October 31st, 1517, October 31st is what? No, not Halloween. It's Reformation Day. We need to bring that back. 1517, Martin Luther issued his 95 thesis in Wittenberg, Germany. The Council of Trent, Latin uh, Concilium Tridentinum, held between 1545 and 1563 in Trento, or Trent, or uh, Bologna, northern Italy, was one of the Roman Catholic Church's most important ecumenical councils, one of the most important. Prompted by the Reform Protestant Reformation, it has been described as the embodiment of the Counter-Reformation. Now, what does counter mean? Counter means against the Reformation. Also called the Catholic Revival or the Catholic Reformation was the period of Catholic resurgence beginning with the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, and ending at the close of the Thirty Years' War, 1648, and was initiated in response to the Protestant Reformation. Now understand the Council of Trent was dominated and led by the Jesuits, the black ops of the papacy. 400 years later, when Pope John the 23rd initiated preparations for the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, he affirmed the decrees it had issued. Quote, what is, still is. That's what he said about the Council of Trent. Quote, as well as decrees, the Council issued condemnations or anathemas, those are curses, of what it defined to be heresies committed by Protestantism, and in response to them, key statements and clarifications of the Church's doctrines and teachings. These addressed a wide range of subjects, including Scripture, the Biblical canon, sacred tradition, original sin, justification, salvation, the sacraments, the Mass, and the veneration of saints, which are another name for gods. The veneration of multiple gods. The council met for 25 sessions between December 13, 1545, and December 4, 1563, all in Trento, then the capital of the Prince Bishopric of Trent in the Holy Roman Empire, apart from the 9th to the 11th sessions held in Bologna, during 1547, Pope Paul III, who uh, convoked the council, presided over these and the first eight sessions, 1545 to 1547, while the 12th to the 16th sessions, 1551 to 1552, were overseen by Pope Julius III, and the 17th to the 25th sessions, 1562 to 1563, by Pope Pius IV. So we see that it went through multiple popes. It was for quite a, a long time. The consequences of the council were also significant as regards the church liturgy and practices. Church liturgy, yes. Public divine worship. 
During its deliberations, the council made the Vulgate the official example of the biblical canon and commissioned the creation of a standard version, although this was not achieved until the 1590s. In 1565, however, a year or so after the council finished its work, Pope the uh, Pius the fourth issued the Tridentine Creed after Tridentum, Trento's Latin name, and his successor, Pius V, then issued the Roman Catechism and revisions of the Breviary and Missal, that would be the Roman Missal, in respectively 1568, 1568, and 1570. These in turn led to the codification of the Tridentine Mass, which remained the church's primary form of the Mass, or the Eucharistic ceremony, which is what, what all the sacraments are centered around, for the next 400 years. Next 400 years, and it was, this, this was codified into the what? into the CCC, yes, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. More than 350 years passed until the next ecumenical council, which was the First Vatican Council, or Vatican I, was convened. All right, well, that's taken from Wikipedia, Council of Trent. A lot of good information in there. Now, the Council of Trent is an ecumenical council recognized by the Roman Catholic Church held from December 13, 1545 to December 4th, 1563. A little bit of a recap. I know I threw a lot of information there. It was held in the Italian city of Trent. It is considered one of the most important councils in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, establishing church doctrine in response to the Reformation and condemning Protestantism. That's why it's really, uh, uh, you have to understand that the Council of Trent has had an impact on Western Christianity. Or Christendom. It clearly specified Catholic doctrines on salvation, the sacraments, and the biblical canon, and standardized the Mass throughout the church, largely abolishing local variations. The Council of Trent was held in an attempt to destroy the progress of the Protestant Reformation. Understand that the Protestant Reformation was going back to biblical Christianity, getting back in from the Protestant Reformation we have the Word of God with 66 books. Okay, important to understand that. Now, it's just amazing that the, the Bible was kept, kept hidden from the common people. Uh, it was not in the common language. That was actually a death penalty. But now it's come forth, and the, the Rome always adapts. Lucifer always adapts his institution. Okay, now... Uh, the Council of Trent was held in an attempt to destroy the progress of the Protestant Reformation. It approved many superstitious and unbiblical beliefs of the Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages, all to be believed under the threat of anathema, or curse. Number one, denied every doctrine of the Reformation from sola scriptura, scriptures alone, to salvation by grace through faith alone. They reject that. They say, if you believe in that, you're anathema, you're cursed. All right, number two, pronounced 125 anathemas, eternal damnation upon anyone believing what evangelicals believe and preach today. But you want to have evangelicals and Catholics together, right? Wrong. Do not yoke yourself with Babylon, folks. Even though it pretends to be your friend, beware. Number three, equal value and authority of tradition and scripture. In actuality, tradition is held above scripture. This is exactly what Jesus Christ was condemning. He was condemning the Pharisees and the Sadducees because their tradition nullified the word of God. Okay. Now, number four, scriptures for the priesthood only, prohibited to anyone in the laity without written permission from one superior. This is a hierarchy. To violate this was, and still is, in most Catholic countries today, considered a mortal sin. Number five, seven sacraments. <clears throat> if you're a church that has seven sacraments, you are Roman Catholic. Number six, communion by eating the bread only, not drinking the wine. Number seven, purgatory. Number eight, indulgences. Number nine, the mass as a propitiatory or atoning offering or sacrifice. <clears throat> a sampling of the anathemas or curses of the Council of Trent. Quote, 
If anyone shall deny that the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore our entire Christ are truly, really, really and substantially contained in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist and shall say that he is only in it as a sign or in a figure or virtually let him be accursed. Canon number one. So if you don't believe that they're, through their priestcraft in the Holy of Holies actually turns it for the elements from the bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ or you're partaking of cannibalism, eating human flesh and drinking human flood, but blood, then you're accursed. <clears throat> so I'm accursed by Roman Catholicism, folks, but I'm blessed by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Mm -hmm. All right, number, another one. These are good. Quote, if anyone shall say that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the a sacrament of the most holy Eucharist together with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and shall deny that wonderful and singular conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood the outward forms of the bread and wine still remaining, which conversion the Catholic Church most aptly calls transubstantiation, let him be accursed, end quote. Canon number two. Now what they're talking about, because they borrow from Greek paganism, Aristotle, Aristotle made a distinction between the essence and the accidents. Look this up. Look, look up transubstantiation in your English language uh, dictionary, the collegiate dictionary. You know, mention accidents. Look up accidents. So the, the smell, taste, you know, all this stuff remains the same, but it's actually the body of Jesus. Even though it tastes, you know, even though this is, feels like a pen, it writes like a pen, it tastes like a pen, it feels like a pen, this is only the accidents but the essence of it is the body of Christ. That's what they believe. All right. I reject that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Here's another one. Quote. This is from your Council of Trent. If anyone shall say that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, even with the open worship of the Latria, which is adoration of a reverence directed only to the Holy Trinity, and therefore not to be venerated with any peculiar festal celebrity, nor to be solemnly carried about in processions according to to the praiseworthy and universal rites and customs of the Holy Church, and that he is not to be publicly set before the people to be adored or worshipped, and that his adorers or idolaters let him be accursed, end quote, Canon 6. Now you have to understand that the priest transfer it from the elements, the bread and wine, from the credence or the credence table to the altar where they re-sacrifice Jesus Christ in a bloodless sacrifice okay and that at the words of institution as they put their incantation the words of institution it is changed into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ into a circular wafer then it's put into a monstrance which really is linked to the word monstrosity or monster and what that is is a sunburst and they don't directly touch it, and then they put a uh, sh humeral veil, uh, which is dealing with your shoulders over, and they march around with a sunburst, and you worship this sunburst. That's what adoration is. You're worshiping it. And that is idolatry. I'll lead you back to the Bible, Exodus 20, 1 through 6. Okay, now let's do another one. Quote, if anyone shall say that the ungodly man is justified by faith only so as to understand that nothing else is required that may cooperate to obtain the grace of justification and that it is in no wise necessary for him to be prepared and disposed by the motion of his own will, let him be accursed. End quote. Canon number nine. What they're saying is that if you believe solely that Jesus Christ atoning blood on Golgotha where he bled out once, you are saved through his sacrifice. You don't have to earn it. You are a curse from Roman Catholicism. And folks, be honest with you, there are so many daughters that follow this same pattern, okay? 
I believe that feast keeping is a part of a workspace religious system because you really can't separate the feast from the sacrifices, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you get into this judgmentalism instead of instead of just focusing on a day, love your neighbor, have your word mean something, okay? Don't get in this pattern of the end justifies the means, you know? Don't elevate your family. Happens all the time. That's what Rome did. That's what the popes did. Had all these bastard children. And then the, through simony and all this bribery was carried forth. That was not of God. Okay? <clears throat> and the last one is if... Uh, no, I actually... Uh, if anyone shall say anything... If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in the divine mercy, pardoning sins for Christ's sake, or that it is that confidence alone by which we are justified, let him be accursed. End quote. Canon 12. So they're cursing Bible-believing Christianity. Don't borrow doctrine from it, folks. We've just finished Doctrines of the Catholic Church, another chapter. So now we're officially going to be starting priestcraft. Very excited. So we're going to talk about the temple, which God says. Remember that when you're dealing with Satan, Satan, will, Satan can't create anything. He's not the creator, okay? So what he does is he takes God's creation and he twists the words, okay? He twists the words. So it's important to understand it becomes a new meaning. Satan always has a counterfeit. So I'm going to build your vocabulary, folks. We're going on a, on a journey. I'm excited about it, and I hope you are too. All right, so now we have the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 states, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? For the temple of God is holy, that means sacred, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Now the temple of God equals believers in Jesus Christ or Christians, all right? So the temples are what? Us, our bodies, not a building, folks. That's a big deal, okay? We're just scratching the surface. But understand that this, all, all this priestcraft is centered around the layout of the building, okay? Now, the temple of God is holy through faith in Christ, resulting in the Spirit of God dwelling in you, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's exactly opposite of what Roman Catholicism says. Roman, the Council of Ten, Roman Catholicism, Vatican Council number one, and Vatican Council number two. And don't be deceived by their apologists to speak out of both sides of their mouth, okay? Go to what they say. This is, a, this is an actual historical and legal document, folks. All right. So we see that um, as a Christian, your human body is the temple of God, and through faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in the temple, making you holy or sacred, because he died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for my sins. All right. Acts. I'm going to have my brother uh, read, uh, my brother Stephen read Acts 17. 24 to 25. Acts 17, 24 to 25. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Amen. So we see that God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but in the living temples are Christians that the Holy Ghost dwelleth in as believers. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now understand the distinction between paganism and Christianity. There is a difference. John 2, 19 through 21. In these verses, we see a twofold definition of the word temple. The Jews were referring to a temple made by hands, while Jesus was referring to his physical body as the temple. A temple 
Let's look at the definition of a temple, an encyclopedia. Quote, a temple from the Latin word templum is a structure reserved for religious or spiritual activities such as prayer and sacrifice. Yes, sacrifice. A templum constituted a sacred precinct as defined by a priest or an augur. Now, an augur is an official diviner of ancient Rome. He's a pagan priest. He's part of the College of uh, Cardinals. It has, it has the same root as the word template. A plan and preparation of the building that was marked out on the ground by the augur. That's where you get, you know, augury. Templa also became associated with the dwelling places of a god or gods. Despite the specific set of meanings associated with the religion of ancient Rome, that's pagan Rome, the word has now become quite widely used to describe a house of worship for any number of religions and is even used for time periods prior to Romans. So basically a shrine or a temple uh, or a building where people come to worship their God is not reserved to Christianity alone. It actually is a universal religious instinct, okay, of all religions. Now, the temple in your collegiate dictionary says uh, temple from the Latin templum, space marked out for observation of auguries. We learned but an augur, divination from omens by an augur, a Roman priest. Temple, probably akin to the Latin tempus or time. Number one, an edifice or a building for the worship of a deity or God, end quote. So temple. Let's look at what Temple states out of the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible by John D. Davis, 1944. Temple, a building dedicated to the worship of a deity. In three passages, it is applied to the tabernacle, but generally the reference is to someone of the temple successfully erected to Jehovah at Jerusalem. During the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 A.D., the Jews themselves, who were using the temple yard as a fortress, set fire to the outer cloisters, but the temple itself was fired by a Roman soldier, contrary to the order of Titus, and all that was combustible was destroyed. Josephus Wars, uh, chapter 6, 3, and page 1. All right, so afterwards, the conquerors threw down the walls, Josephus War. Wars under war. Uh, on its site, the Emperor Hadrian dedicated a temple to Jupiter Capitolinus in 136 AD or earlier. In 363 AD, the Emperor Julian, in order to defeat the prophecy of Christ, good luck to you on that one, Matthew 24, 1 and 2, undertook to rebuild the temple, but his plans were frustrated by flames which burst from the foundation, end quote. And that's taken from Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, Temple, pages 594 to 597. Now, Matthew 24, 1 through 2 states, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to shew him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is the destruction. That's in Matthew 24, 1 through 2. This is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem as prophesied by Christ Jesus, executed by the pagan Roman Empire in 70 A.D. Notice the transition from a temple made by hands to the temple of the human body as a believer in Christ. So they're keeping these feasts um, at this area. It was a central location, and uh, God made sure that it was completely destroyed. And this is the transition from the animal sacrifices and the feast days into a, a, a uh, into the New Testament with a New Testament relationship with Jesus Christ where our bodies are the temples through faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit dwelleth in us through faith. Okay, 
Now, according to the New Testament, the earliest Christians did not, I repeat, did not build church buildings. Instead, they gathered in homes. For example, Acts 17, verse 5. Acts 20, verse 20, and of course, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. Or in Jewish worship places in the second, like the second temple or the synagogues, Acts 2, 46, and Acts 19, verse 8. Acts 17, verse 5 says, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. <clears throat> the Jews believed not. This is who Jesus Christ was condemning. They believed not. Okay, took them to them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Acts 17 verse 5. Acts 20, verse 20, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shewed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house. Just meet where you can, folks. That's the important thing, because you are the temple of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and you're precious, you're important. And when you get caught up in the ritualism and the priestcraft, you don't value relationship. Relationship is, is less important than the ritualism, okay? All right, and then we see, of course, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. And that's what we are. We're just a home church. We're doing the best we can. You can do better, folks. We're just here to be a thread, to tie all the truth together. But follow your calling that the Holy Spirit has given you. Yes, you have a calling. Yes, you are. You don't have to go to seminary to have a calling, okay? You don't have to go to college to have a calling, okay? You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you so choose, okay? Now, it's important to understand that the difference between a temple made with hands and a temple, our bodies, being the temple of the Most High, okay? Because Jesus Christ dwelleth not in a temple made with hands, but he dwelleth in us through the Holy Spirit. So welcome Jesus Christ into your heart, okay? God bless you, and just search things. Thank you.